Today on City Cash Chicago, despite a new report showing the city's arts organizations are still hurting from the pandemic, there is plenty of theater that will take your breath away this fall. Chicago Reader Theater editor Kerry Reed is here with the shows you need to check out and an update on how the scene is recovering. It's Thursday, October 5th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago is talking about. Welcome back to CityCast. Oh, thank you. It's good to be back. No, I appreciate you. We talked last fall, uh, and you always give me such a great list of shows to look forward to. Carrie, people might not think of October as this huge month for theater festivals, but it kind of is. Right now, Destinos, the Chicago International Absolutely. Latino Theater Festival, is happening uh, through November 12th. Can you tell me about this festival and what people can expect this year? Sure. This is, I think, the sixth year they've done it. It's a outgrowth of the uh, Chicago Latino Theater Alliance, which was started by uh, co-founded by the late Mirna Salazar. She died, unfortunately, suddenly last August, right before the fifth festival um, started. And it's just kind of bringing together uh, a lot of the companies that work in Chicago year round doing work from, from the you know uh, Latinx perspective and with Latinx voices, as well as bringing in, as the name implies, international. You get companies from New York, companies from Puerto Rico, Mexico. And it's just this wonderful celebration of all different types of stories, all different types of styles of theater. Uh, uh, before we started, I think you and I were talking about you're looking forward to seeing Lucha Teatel, which is going to go up at the Goodman as part of their Destinos Festival. This I, I did a little uh, preview interview with the creators, and this originated at Prism Theater in Dallas. It is literally a luchadore match. They bring a ring in into a ring. Like, the it theater. It is real time, you know, but they're bringing in sort of like Aztec mythology. From what I understand, it's kind of like an Aztec temple slash wrestling ring, and these deities are fighting it out. And I don't know that I can recommend anything better than that, <laughs> right? I mean... It, it, it's such an exciting crossover from a theater perspective, to say the least. Yeah. And I mean, wrestling is so inherently theatrical anyway that it makes absolute sense for them to be doing this. But there are some really other wonderful shows that are happening. There's one that's coming up called Taxilandia, which sounds really interesting. And that's from New York. And it's uh, the creator is from the Dominican Republic originally. He spent a lot of time as a taxi driver in New York. And so it's kind of like building off taxi cab stories, basically. And I don't know how much they're changing it for Chicago, but my understanding is at points when they've done in other cities, they've brought in the stories of those communities too. So I'm real excited to see how that's going to, how that's going to play out. Um, and there's a company in Chicago that I've never had the chance to see called Tuyato Tariakuri. They're in Marquette Park. They do, you know, family friendly programming. And then they also do, you know, more comedic work, um, most of it in Spanish, but they will have subtitles. And I've decided this is the year I finally got to get down there and see what they're doing. Cause it sounds just like a hoot. <laughs> and, um, Honestly, I think if you just go to clata.org and just start playing around on the schedules there, you should find something that I think would be of interest to you. As I said, a lot of it's in Spanish, some of it's in English. The Spanish work is usually subtitled as is often the English work with Spanish subtitles. So it's definitely bilingual. Yeah. I've always felt like it's a very welcoming and uh, exhilarating way to kick off some of the theater schedule, you know, some of the theater season in Chicago. We'll make sure we drop a link for the sixth annual Destinos. And then there's also the Pearl Clegg Festival running through October 15th, right? Who, who is right. Pearl Clegg and what's special about this festival? Pearl Clegg is a novelist. She's a longtime playwright. She's not from Chicago. That's what's interesting. Uh, she's primarily identified with Atlanta. And I wouldn't say she's unsung by any means, but I think the full breadth of her work maybe doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. So I'm real excited that we're, uh, we're, we're doing that for her in Chicago this fall. Nakarima Society is a comedy about a group of black women in a very, the, the, they're in a debutante society in Montgomery, Alabama, circa 1964. So, you know, the civil rights movement is raging all around them, but they're still in their very proper, you wear the white dress, you go to the cotillion, you're going to go to Fisk. You're going to marry a doctor. <laughs> you know, they mm -hmm. have the lives all planned out. But, you know, reality has a way of uh, kind of throwing some uh, spanners in the works, shall we say. It's primarily a farce, though. I mean, I, what I love about Pearl Clug is that she writes historical-based work that's never preachy. I mean, she just kind of throws these women in as they are there. They have these fully formed, sometimes fully ridiculous, uh, sometimes fully heartbreaking characters. 
And she just lets them kind of interact and be who they are. Uh, I, I think I was just telling a friend about it. It feels like watching like great all-star infielders, you know, when they're just Come on. yeah back and playing the bases, r- checking the runners. I mean, it, there's just so much happening in Nakanaima Society, and it's a terrific, terrific cast. I want to give a special shout-out to Shariba Rivers, who is one of those Chicago actors I just love. She doesn't have a single line in this play. She is the maid. She is in, mostly in the background, And she steals almost every scene just with her facial expressions, her body language. Um, Just an absolutely bravura performance, but she's well matched by everybody else. No, I love that. And the baseball metaphor really set because the last time I was at the Goodman, I was watching Tony Stone. Oh, well, there you go. Which was another transformation (laughs) inside of there. So we talked about two festivals. We'll drop links uh, and information for people. But let's move on to some of the other shows you're excited for, starting with Selena Fillinger's POTUS or behind. Behind every great dumbass are seven women trying to keep them alive, <laughs> which is opening I, at the end of the month. Can I can I just say that's basically on my list because of the title? I mean, who would Come not want to see one. that show? It's a good one. <laughs> Again, this is I mentioned what a tremendous all-star cast we have at Good Nakarema Society. Same thing here at Steppenwolf. The women in this cast, Caroline Neff, Karen Aldridge, Sandra Marquez. I know I'm forgetting people, but it's just a tremendous lineup as well. And to me, I have not seen it, have not read it yet. But I'm getting a real Veep kind of vibe, and I loved that oh, show. I'm a big Veep fan. <laughs> uh, so, it, and as the name implies, it's about the women, you know, behind the man, behind, you know, behind the resolute desk who keeps screwing up. And you know, I don't know that it's particularly based on any... I was going to say, how, presidents living or dead. how much is going to make <laughs> us cringe about the things we're dealing with on uh, in the last, you know, yeah. couple of terms. But I think there might be some, you know, resonant moments with, with what was recently said about some of the women who worked for the, the past administration. And um, But again, you know, very comedic. I think sometimes people think of fall as when the serious subjects come forth. but uh, And they do, but um, I think it's interesting that both Steppenwolf and Goodman are kind of, you know, foregrounding A, you know, comedies, and B, comedies with large ensembles of tremendously gifted women. Um, So that's a real exciting thing for me to think about. I love how excited you are for these these new productions that are coming out. The ones you've seen, the ones that you're planning to see. I think that's the, yeah, but you know, Jacoby, that's the thing. When When you get to cover people and you see what they're capable of. Like I mentioned Shariba Rivers in Nakarima Society. I've loved Caroline Neff for years, so I'm so excited to see what she'll do, you know, at Steppenwolf. From the Goodman to Steppenwolf to Facility Theater in Humble Park, you're excited for Right Now, which is opening October 26th. Why should listeners add this one to their list? You know, I think if you're looking for something a little offbeat, this is a new theater in Humboldt Park. Kirk Anderson, who runs Facility Theater, has kind of been a go-to guy in fringe theater for a while. Uh, So that's one name. The other name is Dado. She's a director around town who always seems to choose super interesting material, stuff that's offbeat. Um, And this show sounds like it's right up there. And it sounds like a very much like a psychological thriller, like almost like Rosemary's Baby or something. Uh, You know, there's a couple living across the hall. There's a baby. Is there actually a baby? Are things really happening the way they (laughs) think they're happening? You know, like, oh, it just seems like a regular social engagement. But now it's really kind of going in a dark and creepy direction. How much of it's mental illness and trauma? How much of it is uh, maybe perhaps something supernatural? I'm not really sure, but the description certainly intrigues me. And I think in that I have been to facility for other things while they've been fixing up the space. It's just your great classic Chicago storefront place. You know, not a lot of pretension about it, but if if you're looking for something kind of, you know, a little bit uh, clammy and right in your face, I have a feeling that this <laughs> show may, may, may scratch that itch for you, so to speak. <laughs> Well, how I mean, in a time when we're talking about shows or, or theater productions pulling back, giving mm-hmm. shorter runs, what it, how exciting is it to see a new space opening up for theater in Chicago? Absolutely. You know, there were a lot of people who had plans for new spaces that I thought, oh, maybe this isn't going to happen. But they're they're charging on ahead with that. And again, seeing some of these casts that are a little bit larger that I've mentioned, that's also nice. Hey, I love a great you know, two-character, one-act play. Mm-hmm. But 
a steady diet of that, you might be like, can we get a few more people on here? Because I know we have them in Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) In terms of a company that's maybe reinventing a little bit, again, this is out in the western suburbs, Oak Park Festival Theater, which has been producing Shakespeare and other classics in Austin Gardens for well over 40 years. They got a new artistic director this year, Peter Anderson, and he's not directing this show, but he has booked it. It's a piece called Seagulls. And it's a new rock musical version of Anton Chekhov's play, The Seagull. Uh, And it just sounds real intriguing, and it's being staged at Pleasant Home Mansion, so I imagine it'll be a pretty interesting kind of environmental production. Again, it's one of those, hmm, I don't know much more about it than that, but in terms of taking their mission of classics and moving it into a new, you know, uh, updated, maybe appealing a little bit more to younger audiences direction, I think that's a real interesting thing that that, uh, that, that Oak Park Festival's taken a, taken a chance on. Speaking of stepping outside the box, is there anything immersive or interactive for folks wanting something a little bit different, who like their theater would aside a spectacle? You know, there tend to be um, shows like that that pop up. Certainly one that would be... Uh, uh, along that line would be Rough House Theater, which performs, uh, or I don't know if it's even performs, it's more presents a show called The Exquisite Corpse. And they've been doing this for several years at the Chopin, I believe at the Chopin. And it's more like installations with puppetry. Uh, so kind of like a combination of a haunted house and an installation art exhibit. You visited everything from the biggest theaters in Chicago to the pop-up theaters, but is there a favorite playhouse or a theater that just has your heart? No matter what they're putting on, who is there, you're in the seats. Gosh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, of the bigger houses, I feel like I, I've been pretty stoked with, uh, well, with both Goodman and Steppenwolf lately, um, but I, I think Steppenwolf's been doing some interesting things. I kind of like that new theater in the round that they have. But with smaller companies, you know, one that I wouldn't sleep on, they've been around for a long time, but they've really been killing it. I haven't seen their latest production, but Shattered Globe Theater, which produces at Theater Wit, I think Cook Handy has done some really tremendous work in the basement of the the Chopin. And, you know, I've always got a soft spot for Hell in a Handbag, which is one of the longest running purveyors of camp (laughs) theater in Chicago. Their next show, I think, is coming up this Christmas. They're going to be doing the um, another chapter in their long-running Golden Girls The Lost Episodes. For people who've never seen that, they it's it's people in drag playing the Golden Girls, and they have created all new episodes, and it's absolutely filthy-minded, but absolutely heartwarming at the same time. <laughs> so it's kind of like if the Golden Girls were like after hours, you know, <laughs> that's kind of what these shows are like. I mean, Carrie, it's hard for me to believe, but you and I have had this conversation a few times over the last two and a half years. And when we first met and talked, the entire country was really going through a a reckoning, right? Mm. In the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, what it felt like. Uh, we talked about theater companies trying to provide more uh, diverse work, trying mm-hmm. to be more accessible, make sure the stories that are being told on stage represent the various communities in Chicago. And then last year, we were talking about you know, trying to come out of the height of the pandemic. How do you think Chicago's theater scene over the last couple of years has responded to those two particularly deep challenges? Are we at pre-pandemic levels and are we seeing more representative work? I think the answer is yes, no, maybe. I'm not real sure. I mean, there have been a few instances of, in terms of leadership at theater companies around town, of companies bringing in black leaders and be patting themselves in the back and saying, Hey, we're really, look at us, we're doing this. And then it kind of, they didn't get for whatever reason, they didn't seem to get the support they needed, especially trying to bring these companies back to production after pandemic and the companies folded. Um, so that that's been a little heartbreaking and disappointing. Um, in rich Chicago, which is a group that does a lot of work trying to, you know, do, uh, DEI trainings and different kinds of surveys of workers in the field just released their first racial justice study, kind of showing a lot of the people, at least, who are working at these organizations, and I think it's not just arts organizations, but also nonprofit funding organizations, are saying, yeah, you know, there's still a gap between the public pronouncements and, you know, what we experience or what we know, you know, what transparency we have. So there's still work to do for that, for sure. I mean, I think 
in terms of what's on stage, yes, there's definitely been a push to bring more diverse stories on stage. And, you know, there's been a weird kind of, to my mind, completely unsubstantiated narrative that, well, people aren't coming back to theater because, you know, there's too many of these woke stories on stage. And I, I don't really think that that's the issue. I, I mean, if you talk about diversity, a lot of it's new plays. As you've heard me talk today, I don't know all of these plays. They may have been done in New York or they may have been done elsewhere, but they're new to me. Um, and I think there is still, you know, the residual of, of the pandemic. Um, it's more just, you know, people got used to being able to stream sitting on their couches. It's hard to get them back in the habit of going out. It's not cheap. If you're on CTA, then you got to deal with, you know, some of the problems that they've had. I just missed a show last weekend because my train broke down and I couldn't get to there in time. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, yeah well, that's not, I'm not blaming the CTA because, you know, things happen. But there are people who are still worried about going to the theater. I would say, unlike past years, most places are no longer requiring proof of vax. Some might still require masking or they may have, if you prefer to be in an audience where it's all masked, I have noticed some of them are saying, you know, we're going to have one or two performances that are mask required. And I, again, I would hope that people, you know, would honor that because, you know, this thing's not gone yet. I was going to say, even as rates go up, do you think yeah. some shows or some theaters might offer a few more mask optional shows or mask only shows or maybe even increase those those recommendations you know they might and you know the, especially for small companies they don't necessarily always have the understudies like the bigger houses do so if somebody in the cast gets sick that's a little harder for them to shift around and if they have to cancel performances that really starts eating into their bottom line so that's one thing i keep in the back of my head still tend to mask at the theater that's my choice i'm not judging anybody else for what they do but it just kind of feels like well this is a it's a small enough thing that i can do right but i would say you know just be respectful before i let you go for someone listening to this conversation who hears the options but might still be on the fence, might not consider themselves mm -hmm. a theater goer, what would be your last piece of advice to, to get someone to try it out this fall? I think make it an evening for yourself. Like a lot of theaters have very nice bars and restaurants. I mean, certainly Steppenwolf does. Uh, I was just at Goodman last night and Petarino's is right next door. You know, if you think of it as an event, it could be a date night or it could be a group of, with your friends. I mean, here's one thing I, I loved it's not necessarily my favorite musical, but Mercury Theater in, uh, on Southport in Lakeview, they did Rock of Ages this summer. The night I went, there was a group of people, let's just say my age, I won't tell you mm -hmm. what that is, but you know, mm, you know, older Gen X, shall we just say? <laughs> they knew, and Rock of Ages is a, you know, it's a musical with all the mm -hmm. 80s hair, hair rock, you know, hair band classics. And these, these people were out for a birthday party. They were not obnoxious. They were having fun. They were singing along. They had all been out to dinner. They hadn't seen each other in a while. And I, that actually made me feel fairly joyous, you know? So yeah. think about it. Like, whether it's taking your kids to see a show, you know, at Chicago Children's Theater or someplace. Um, My partner is taking her mom to see Taste of Soul at Black Ensemble oh, Theater this weekend. Oh, Oh my gosh! If you and don't have fun at Black Ensemble, lunch and, I, you know, and theater day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that makes it more because it's mo it's supposed to be communal. You know, I, I don't always get to bring people to you know because it's work. So sometimes I'm by myself, but it's always great to be around other people, enjoying you know something live that we're all experiencing at the same time. Carrie Reed covers theater, dance, art across the city of Chicago. Carrie, we appreciate you making time for us oh. and tell everyone back at The Reader we say hello. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Before I let you go, for more, including some extra camping tips from our friend Eve Ewing and a fall food flavors guide, check out our website at chicago.citycast.fm. That's also where you can subscribe to our newsletter, Hey Chicago. Of course, I got to leave you with some good news. Tomorrow is the final day to check out Food Truck Fridays at Daily Plaza. Now, if you miss it, no worries. This Saturday and Sunday, Chicago's Food Truck Festival will be at LaBau Woods on the northwest side from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. As always, we appreciate you for reading and listening. Make sure you're also replying to the DMs and hitting us up at 773-780-0246. That's where you can send your ideas, your compliments, or, you know, you can also reach out with some criticism. We're going to read it all. I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. Peace.